Artis, Rotational Rick here, talking to you about the area between two curves. Now I got a question. Why does the physics teacher always teach his classes at the edge of a cliff? Because that's where students have the most potential. Whoa, Pickle Rick! First thing we're do is review a representative rectangle. So if you recall, when we wanted to find the exact area between two curves, what we would do is we would add up the areas of an infinite amount of rectangles in here. And those rectangles would be based on this representative rectangle here. Now, this representative rectangle just shows what each of the rectangles would look like. Its height would be based on the y value of your upper function minus the y value of your lower function at some certain x value, x sub i. The width of that rectangle would be delta x. And as you add up, up an infinite amount of rectangles in here your delta x would approach zero now let's quickly review calculating the area between two curves so here we have two curves f and g and we are on a closed interval from a to b if we want to find the area between those two curves what we said is we would add up the areas of an infinite amount of rectangles the only issue is how do you add up the areas of an infinite amount of rectangles you use integration so integration will add up the areas of an infinite amount of rectangles to give you this exact area now to get this area in particular what you would do is you would take the integral from a to b of f of x and subtract the integral from a to b of g of x and by our properties of definite integrals we could actually just write this as the integral from a to b of f of x minus g of x dx so like we just said if you want to find the area between two curves on a given closed interval from a to b all you have to do is take the integral from a to b of your upper function which in this case would be f of x minus your lower function which in this case would be g of x this definite integral will get you the exact area between these two curves on this given interval now let's quickly talk about integration as an accumulation process. So this says find the region bounded by the graphs of the given functions and describe the integration as an accumulation process. So we have the function y is equal to 4 minus x squared. That would be a downward facing parabola. And our other function is the x axis, which we can write as y is equal to 0. So what I want to show you here is that the area between your upper function and your lower function actually builds across your interval. It doesn't just all of a sudden become the area between those two curves. That area actually increases as you go across your interval so let's take a look at what this graph looks like we're looking at the region bounded by this downward facing parabola and the x-axis so that would be this region right here notice that our two functions our upper function this downward facing parabola and our x-axis those intersect at x is equal to negative 2 and x is equal to positive 2 so that's the interval we're focusing on and again what I'm trying to show you is integration as an accumulation process as we integrate across this given interval the area under the curve is just going to add up until it gives us the exact area under the curve so if we start by taking the integral from negative 2 to negative 2 of our upper function minus our lower function again our upper function is 4 minus x squared minus our lower function which is just y equals 0 so 4 minus x squared minus 0 is just 4 minus x squared that's why this is the only function that you see so we're just evaluating the definite integral from negative 2 to negative 2 of 4 minus x squared dx now if you evaluate a definite integral from some constant to that same constant it's just going to equal 0 so we start off with an area of 0 but then as we move across, we're going to take the integral from negative 2 to negative 1 of 4 minus x squared dx, and we get 5 thirds. As we continue on, we take the integral from negative 2 to 0 of 4 minus x squared dx, and we get 16 thirds. So it's adding up. Then we take the integral from negative 2 to 1 of 4 minus x squared dx, and we get 9. So again, adding up even more. And then we take the integral from negative 2 to 2 of 4 minus x squared dx, and that gives you 32 thirds. That is the exact area between our two functions on this given given interval so you can now see the integration taking place as an accumulation process as you go across that given interval and I'm going to show you that this integral does in fact equal 32 thirds right now did you hear about the man who got cooled to absolute zero he's okay get it zero kill it it's example time so example one says find the area of the region bounded by the graphs of our given functions. So here we have our two functions, y is equal to 4 minus x squared and the x-axis, which we said was the function y is equal to 0. Now we have our two functions, so we need to find the area of the region bounded by the graphs of these two functions. So in order to find the area between two functions on a given interval, we need to first figure out what is our interval. And because they don't give us an interval, they don't give us anything to determine our interval, it's going to be where these two functions intersect one another. They're going to intersect at two or more places. So what we have to do is 
set these two functions equal to one another so we can solve for x and determine the x values at which they intersect. So I'm going to set 4 minus x squared equal to 0, and I'm going to solve for x. That will show me the x values at which these two functions intersect. So how do I solve this for x? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add x squared to both sides and subtract 4 from both sides. I do that because now you see that this is a difference of squares. And from your Algebra 1 days, you remember how to factor a difference of squares. This is going to factor into the quantity x plus 2 times the quantity x minus 2. Now, I have two things multiplied together to equal 0, meaning I can use the zero product property and set each of these equal to 0 and solve for x. When I do that, I get x is equal to 2 and x is equal to negative 2. Those would be my two x values at which these two functions intersect, meaning those two x values are going to bound the region between these two functions, meaning I'm going to set up my interval based on where these two functions intersect. So now that I have my interval, I just need to figure out which function is greater on this given interval, meaning which function has greater y values on this given interval. So what you may be able to do is just look at these two functions and say, oh, on this given interval from negative 2 to 2, this function is going to have greater y values than this function. But if you can't tell, what you can do is you can plug in an x value on this interval to each of these functions for x and determine which produces a greater y value. That will show you which function is greater on this interval. So because both of these functions have y equals in them, I'm going to change y in each of these so we can distinguish between our two functions. I'm going to call this function f of x and this function g of x. So now we have our two functions. And in order to determine which is greater on this given interval, we're going to pick an x value on this interval, plug it in for x in each of these functions, see which produces a greater y value. So what's an easy x value to choose on this given interval? How about zero? I'm going to plug in zero for x here and simplify and I end up getting four, meaning the y value of this function at x is equal to zero is four. Then I'm going to plug in zero to this function for x and simplify. There is no x over here. So I just get zero, meaning at x is equal to zero, the y value of this function is zero. So this function produces a greater y value at x is equal to zero, meaning on this given interval, f of x is going to be greater than or equal to g of x. This is our greater function, meaning I can now set up my definite integral to find the exact area between our two functions. So it's going to be the integral from negative 2 to 2 of our upper function, which is f of x minus our lower function, which is g of x. I now can plug in what each of those functions are equal to and evaluate this definite integral using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's first simplify what's inside the parentheses here. 4 minus x squared minus 0 is just 4 minus x squared. Now let's evaluate this definite integral. So to evaluate this definite integral, I first want to take the antiderivative of each term in here. I then evaluate using the fundamental theorem of calculus. I take our upper limit of integration 2, plug that in for each of the x's. I subtract when I plug in our lower limit of integration for each of the x's. I then simplify each of these and I end up getting the area between our two functions on the interval from negative 2 to 2 is 32 thirds, exactly what we found before. We could also confirm this with the graph that we saw earlier, and you see that we did in fact set up our integral correctly. It's the integral from negative 2 to 2 of our upper function, which is our downward facing parabola, 4 minus x squared, minus our lower function, which in this case was just y is equal to 0. Now example two says find the area of the region bounded by the graphs of the given equation. So here we have x is equal to three minus y squared and x is equal to y plus one. So this is going to be a little different this time, but let's pretend it's the same for a second. If I want to find the area between our two equations right here, what I would do is I would solve each of these for y first. So over here, I would add y squared to both sides, subtract x from both sides and take the square root of both sides. I get y is equal to plus or minus square root of three minus x. Over here, I would just subtract one from both sides. I get y is equal to x minus one. Now what we would normally do is determine where the graphs of each of these intersect so we can determine our interval on which we're going to integrate. So let's take a look at what the graphs of each of these look like. Here this black line would be the function y is equal to x minus 1 and over here this curve would be the graph of y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 3 minus x. Now a quick thing to note would be that this is not a function because each of these x values has more than one corresponding y value and technically when you graph this you graph each of these separately. You graph y is equal to the positive square root of 3 minus x and y is equal to to the negative square root of 3 minus x. The positive version starts at the x-axis and goes up. The negative version starts at the x-axis and goes down. Now, why are we looking at the graph? Instead of just setting these two equal to one another, solving for x, figuring out what our interval is, and then integrating that way. Well, if you take a look at the graph of each of these equations here, you see that they intersect at x is equal to negative 1 and x is equal to 2. So if you were to just set up your integral from negative 1 to 2 of your upper equation, which in this case would be y is equal to x minus 1, minus your lower equation, 
equation, which in this case would be y is equal to the negative square root of 3 minus x, that would give you the area from x is equal to negative 1 to x is equal to 2. So all of this area up until this red or pink dashed line right here. But what about this area over here? This area right here is still included in the region bounded by the graphs. So we need to add this to our area over here to get the exact area of the region bounded by these graphs. So what we would have to do is we'd have to set up two separate integrals. One would be the integral that we already talked about, the integral from negative 1 to 2 of our upper equation, x minus 1, minus our lower equation, negative rad 3 minus x, plus the integral from 2 to 3 of our upper equation, which in this case would be the square root of 3 minus x, minus our lower equation, which in this case would be the negative square root of 3 minus x. That will give you the exact area of this pink region. Now, it's no secret that this would suck. This would take a lot of work. There has to be a better way to do this. Well, lucky for you, there is. Up until this point, to find the area between two curves, we have always been integrating with respect to x. But what if we integrated with respect to y? What if, instead of our representative rectangles being vertical, they were horizontal? Now, this may take a little work, but you have to completely change your thinking. Instead of integrating from left to right, we're integrating from down to up. So what we have to do is think about our greater function or our upper function being whichever function is furthest to the right, whichever function has greater x values on this given interval. And our interval is now going to be based on the y values, no longer the x values. So if we wanted to find the exact area of this pink region by integrating with respect to y, what we would do first is make sure both of our equations are set equal to x, meaning they're in terms of y, which they are. Then we would set up our integral from negative 2 to 1 because we're integrating with respect to y of our upper equation which would be whichever is furthest to the right which in this case would be 3 minus y squared minus our lower equation which is whichever equation is furthest to the left which in this case would be y plus 1. If I were to evaluate that definite integral it would give me the exact area between these two curves which would be the same area that I would have got if I had evaluated with respect to x and added up those two separate definite integrals. Now one way is going to be much easier than the other way. And I hope you can tell that in this particular case, it's much easier to integrate with respect to y than x. Now, let's pretend for a second that we didn't know what the graph looked like. The first thing that should tip you off that something's different here is that both of these equations are solved for x. They're in terms of y. And also, this right here would not be a function. It would be a sideways parabola. So because of that, we're likely going to want to integrate with respect to y instead of x. So what we need to do first is find the interval on which we're going to integrate, meaning we need to figure out where these two equations equal equal one another. And since they're both equal to x, we can set each of these equal to one another and solve for the y values at which each of these intersect. So if we set 3 minus y squared equal to y plus 1 and solve for y, we first notice that there's a y squared and a y, so I need to get everything to one side of the equation. I'm going to add y squared to both sides, subtract 3 from both sides. I get 0 is equal to y squared plus y minus 2. Now I have a quadratic trinomial that I know how to factor, and it factors into the quantity y plus 2 times the quantity y minus 1. I know that these two things multiply together to make 0, so using the zero product property, either this is equal to zero or this is equal to zero. I solve both of those separate equations. I get y is equal to negative two and y is equal to positive one, meaning my interval that I'm going to integrate on is going to be the interval from negative two to one. And these are y values, not x values. So again, to find the area of the region bounded by these two graphs, I need to set up a definite integral and it's going to be the integral from negative two to one of my upper equation minus my lower equation. And in order to determine which is my upper equation, which has greater x values on this given interval, I need need to plug in some y value on this interval to each of my equations up here to determine which has a greater x value. That will then be my greater equation on that given interval. So what I'm going to do is label each of these separately so we can distinguish between the two. We're going to call this one f of y and this one g of y. So I'm going to pick some y value on this interval to plug into each of these equations here. How about zero? If I plug in zero for y in this equation over here and simplify, I get f of zero is equal to three, meaning at y y is equal to zero, our x value is three. Over here, if I plug in zero and simplify, I end up getting g of zero is equal to one, meaning at y is equal to zero, our x value is one. So on this particular interval, this equation right here has greater x values than this one, meaning this is gonna be our upper equation, this is gonna be our lower equation. So we can now set up our definite integral. Remember, it's gonna be the integral from negative two to one of, and in this case, f is gonna be our greater equation, so it's gonna be three minus y squared minus our lower equation, which is y plus one. So if I plug in what each of those are equal to, I can now evaluate this definite integral. So we start by simplifying inside the brackets here, three minus y squared minus y plus one. We distribute that negative to the y and to the one. We 
We then simplify, we get negative y squared minus y plus two. We now evaluate this definite integral using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So we take the antiderivative of each of these terms separately. We then take our upper limit of integration, plug it in for each of the y's and subtract when we take our lower limit of integration and plug it in for each of the y's. We then simplify each of these parentheses and we end up getting 27 over six, which we simplify to nine halves. Meaning the exact area between the graphs of these two equations right here is going to be nine halves. Again, we can confirm this with our graph, and we see that we set up our definite integral properly. It was from y is equal to negative 2 to y is equal to positive 1. This was our greater equation, 3 minus y squared. This was our lower equation, y plus 1. Perfect. Now, I also want you to note that had we evaluated both of those definite integrals that we set up at the beginning with respect to x, we would have got the exact same answer. The process just would have taken way longer. Now, example three, doing the exact same thing. So let's pretend we didn't know what we were doing again, and we're just going to solve each of these for y. If we solve each of these equations right here for y, we end up getting y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 2y minus x, and y is equal to negative x. If we then were to look at the graphs of these two equations, they look something like this. So once again, by looking at a graph, we notice that there's an issue in integrating with respect to x. If we were to just integrate with respect to x on this interval from x is equal to negative 3 to x is equal to 0, our upper equation equation in this case would be y is equal to the square root of 2y minus x, whereas our lower equation would be y is equal to negative x. But from the interval from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 1, our upper equation would still be y is equal to the square root of 2y minus x, but our lower equation now is y is equal to the negative square root of 2y minus x. So if we want to evaluate the area of this region with respect to x, we would have to set up two separate definite integrals and add them together. But let's say we want to make it easier on ourselves. What we would do to find the exact area here, instead of integrating with respect to x, we would integrate with respect to y, meaning our representative rectangle, instead of being vertical, would be horizontal. So all I would do is I would set up a definite integral based on the y values where these two equations intersect. So it would be the integral from y is equal to 0 to y is equal to 3 of our upper equation, meaning whichever equation has greater x values on this given y interval, which would be x is equal to y times the quantity 2 minus y, minus our lower equation, which in this case, is x equals negative y. If I evaluate that integral with respect to y, I would get this exact area, which would be much easier than evaluating two separate definite integrals with respect to x and adding them together. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's pretend for a second we didn't know what the graph looked like. How would I know to integrate this with respect to y instead of x? Well, your first clue would be that both of these equations are solved for x. They're in terms of y, meaning your question is trying to tell you to integrate with respect to y instead of x. Your second clue would be this particular equation right here. If I were to distribute that, I would get 2y minus y squared. Anytime you have x is equal to y squared or some form of y squared over here, you're going to have a sideways parabola, meaning you're not going to have a function. So it's going to be a little harder to solve this for y. So again, we're setting up our definite integral with respect to y. So the first step is to figure out the interval on which we're going to integrate on, meaning we need to figure out at what y values do these two equations intersect. So we're going to set each of these equal to one another and solve for y. So how do we solve for y here? Well, since we have a y squared and a y, we need to get everything to one side of the equation. So we're going to add y squared to both sides, subtract 2y from both sides. We get 0 is equal to y squared minus 3y. Now, how do we solve this for y? Well, each of these terms has a y we can factor out. And now we have two things that multiply together together to equal zero. So we can use zero product property, set this equal to zero and set this equal to zero and solve for y. And we end up getting y is equal to either zero or three. So our interval that we're going to integrate on is from zero to three. Now that we know our interval, we need to figure out which equation has greater x values on this given interval. So to determine that, what we're going to do is we're going to plug in some y value on this interval to each of these equations to determine which produces a greater x value. So I'm going to call this equation f of y and I'm called this equation g of y because we want to distinguish between the two. So in this equation, I'm going to plug in some y value on this interval to determine which gives us a greater x value. So how about one? If I plug in one for y and simplify, I end up getting a x value of three. If I plug in one for y here and simplify, I end up getting an x value of negative one, meaning that on this given interval, this equation produces greater x values than this one, meaning this equation is going to be greater than or equal to this one on our specified interval. So I can now set up my definite integral. It's going to be the integral from zero to three of my upper equation, which is 2y minus y squared minus my lower equation, which is negative y. So all I have to do then is simplify in here. And now I can evaluate this definite integral using the fundamental theorem of calculus. First step would be to find the antiderivative of each of these. So when I do that, I can now use
use the fundamental theorem of calculus by taking my upper limit of integration three plugging it in for each of the y's and subtracting when i plug in my lower limit of integration zero for each of the y's i then simplify and i end up getting that the exact area of the region bounded by these two equations these two graphs is going to be 27 over 6 which simplifies to nine halves I can then confirm this with the graph and we see that we did in fact set this up properly it's the integral from y is equal to zero to y is equal to three of our upper equation which is x is equal to y times the quantity two minus y minus our lower equation which is x is equal to negative y perfect we got the right answer